Um, well, hey, we're going to jump into uh, the Word this morning. And as uh, many of you walked in, you had the opportunity to be given a palm branch. I don't know if you got one. Maybe like as you're walking in, you're like, I'm not really into gardening. No, thank you. I don't know why I would need that. Um, I didn't know I was going to Catholic Mass. I will explain it. Okay, and I'm pretty sure on our way out, after I'm done explaining why you want one of these, you'll probably grab one on your way out to think about it all week. Today, uh, we are celebrating something called Palm Sunday. And unfortunately, I think for many of us that were maybe raised church in church, maybe you weren't, maybe you raised Catholic. A lot of people in our church were raised Catholic as kids, or maybe Presbyterian or Lutheran or maybe not church at all. There's these things that uh, for Christians, there's these big events that we have per year. Um, like right now, we are in Palm Sunday. We are just now finishing a season that uh, the global church, the historical church, calls Lent. We, back around Christmas, had a whole season called Advent. Uh, we have Easter weekend coming up. There's Christmas Day while we celebrate that. As of right now, if you talk to any Jewish friends or any like, uh, Christians that follow the historical calendar, today starts something that we call Holy Week. There's all these events, there's all these days. I think for some, for some of us in the room, especially if you were raised Christian, I think sometimes we celebrate days because of tradition, not because of revelation. So even today, it's like, cool, Palm Sunday, get the outfit on, take some pics, post, like, yay, Palm Sunday. Easter, it's like the thing to do, like, you know, go to Easter Sunday, get the outfit on, take the family out, get the family pic, go get some mimosas, have brunch, it's Easter weekend. But I think for, sometimes we forget why we celebrate these days. And the purpose behind these days, specifically Palm Sunday. So today I'm gonna read to us the passage in Matthew 21 on Palm Sunday. And I'm gonna preach on why we celebrate Palm Sunday, why we call it Palm Sunday. It was, it was awesome and a little embarrassing how many people after last service came up to me like, I've never been told my entire life why we call it Palm Sunday. As a Christian, being raised in church their entire life, like I had no idea why we call it Palm Sunday. How many in the room you just identify before I even get in the sermon, you really have no idea why we call it Palm Sunday? Like you really, a good portion of you. I'm gonna help you out today. All right? You guys good? You happy? Do you like who you're sitting next to? I think I heard some no's in there. Hopefully that wasn't your spouse. We're going to read from Matthew 21 today. Matthew 21. We're going to read the actual Palm Sunday story in Matthew 21. If you have a Bible, uh, you can turn there with me. If you don't have one, there's one right there in the seat back. That's the ESV version. I'm going to read from the NLT today, but you can grab that. Or it'll be on the big old Sky Bible right there for you to follow along. Matthew 21 says this in just verse 1. It says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem... They came to a town of Bethage on Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them, two of the disciples ahead. He said, go into the village over there. He said, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied up there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it. I love that. If anyone asks to say, the Lord needs it. He will immediately let you take them. Verse four, this took place from a quote from the book of Isaiah. To fulfill the prophecy that was said 800 years ago, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, pay attention to these phrases, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a a donkey's colt. The two disciples did it just as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and they threw the garments over the colt and he sat on it. Verse eight, most the crowd, most the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of them. And others cut branches, palm branches, and laid it, uh, spread it on the road ahead of Jesus. Verse 9, Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people around him were shouting, praise God, or Hosanna, 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 for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest of heavens. Verse 10, the entire city of Jerusalem, the entire city of Jerusalem was up in arms as he entered. Who is this, they asked. Who is this, they asked. And all the crowds begin to shout, this, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Can anybody else hear that like buzzing? Or is that just me? Eric, I don't know if it's this middle one, but it's buzzing real loud. Forget about it? Yeah, okay, good call. Um, <laughs> let's pray. Lord, fix the buzzing, Lord. 
God, we thank you for today. Would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, would you speak to every heart, every mind, every person, every marriage? God, every single person in this room is going through something different. Highs, lows, jobs, marriage, kids, finances, school, business. God, you know the plight and the position of every single human in this room. God, I might not, but you do. God, I pray you'd speak to us as we talk about this day, as we start Holy Week. God, why is it holy? Why do we call it that? Today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, would you open our eyes, would you open our ears to understand this significant day that we celebrate as followers of Jesus? God, we thank you for today. Father, we also pray that the Mariners would make it to the playoffs and win more than one game. God, we've officially given up on the Blazers. We switch our attention to the other things. God, you didn't hear my prayer for six months. Would you hear this one though, Lord? Shine your face upon the Mariners organization in your mighty name, I pray. And everybody that has faith said? Amen. Amen. Um, today, I'm gonna go through this story. And one thing that you must understand about the Bible is that this book is a divine orchestration between God and man. This is, for those of us in this room that are followers of Jesus, we don't believe this is just a man book, it's a God book. Though it was physically written by a man, it was spoken by God. And this is our life, this is our light into our path, this is the word into our feet, this is what we build our life upon. But one thing that's really interesting if you're newer to Jesus in, in the room is, especially in the New Testament, there's a lot of really, really weird details in this book that seem very random. Like, why do I need to be told there's six water pots? Why not two? Why not nine? Why does that matter? Why does it matter what city they go into? Does that really matter, the city they find themselves? Why does it matter that there was 12 people, not 15, not nine? Why 12? Why does it matter what time of day? Why does it keep saying the third hour or the ninth hour or the second watch? Why does the Bible give way to so many details? Those details are there not for literature, they're for, they're for theology. It's not just a random detail in a story because we want to know that there's 12 people or that they're in the Jerusalem or that it was at the ninth hour or it was during uh, you know, the, the certain watch or Passover or fill in the blank of a detail. It's there for a reason. It's there because it's trying to show us something on these details. Today, I want to go through four details that we find ourselves in Matthew 21 that we can easily read over. Don't really matter to you and I, but they deeply matter to our theology. And they deeply matter to this day that we call Palm Sunday. Four details, four words that I want to bring up, four sentences I want to bring up in Matthew 21 in these 11 verses. But I want to ask them in the form of a question. I have four questions for you that I want you to consider. Number one is this. The first detail, the first question I want you to uh, see in this text, number one, is, is he your king? Is he your king? Now, if you are a studious person and you want to go read the entire New Testament this week, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John specifically, the four Gospels, you will notice this. It's a very interesting detail that the Holy Spirit wants us to know. Every, I mean every, every single time Jesus healed someone, did a miracle, saved someone, or did anything God-like, people would start talking about him and he would say this, shh, don't tell anyone. Why? If I'm Jesus' like marketing manager, I'm like, no, this is PR. Tell everyone you raise Lazarus. Tell everyone you open blind eyes. But every, every single time in all the gospels, he did something godlike. He would say, don't tell anyone. Shh. And they'd go start talking. And if, if the, which is also funny, every single time he said, shh, they told everyone. <laughs> they would tell the whole city. But it's interesting, every single time the city started finding out who he was, he would leave the city as soon as possible. He constantly told people, don't call me the son of David. Don't call me the Messiah. Don't say things about me. Don't tell everyone what I did. Except this story. This is the first story in all of the gospels where Jesus allows an entire city to call him by his name. We are reading, they're yelling, son of David. Son of David. They're yelling this out loud, Hosanna, son of David. Now, if you have Jewish friends that still practice Judaism, or if you are aware of Old Testament, first century Jewish world, they told everyone one day in the future, a man is gonna come to be our Messiah and we will call him son of David. That's gonna be his name. We will identify our Messiah as calling him the son of David. Every other time in the gospels that somebody called Jesus son of David, he said, shh. 
Don't say that out loud. Don't tell people who I am. He constantly tried to hide himself until this day. Now, he's not telling people be quiet. Now an entire city, the entire city, the Bible says, of Jerusalem, is now out in a procession, out in a parade, yelling, son of David, son of David, Hosanna. And he finally, for the first time, says, yes, that's me. What's interesting when you read the Gospels is that Jesus was not crucified because he healed people. Jesus was not crucified because he taught the scriptures. Jesus was not crucified because he was a rabbi. Jesus was not crucified because he was a good person. Jesus was not crucified because he was a prophet. Jesus was not crucified because he was fill in the blank. The reason why he was crucified is because he said, I'm the king. Because there were other kings other Caesars, other royalties, other kingdoms. And the reason why the Jewish community and the Pharisees killed Jesus, crucified him in seven days from now, is because he says, I'm the king now. In other words, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, what is he saying? I'm the final king. There's been kings before me, there won't be any after me. There's been names before me, there won't be any after me. There's been processions before me, there'll be none after me. Jesus is making a cosmic eternal statement by riding into the kingdom, into Jerusalem, saying, son of David. And the first time, he welcomes it. In other words, he's finally saying, it's time for people to know who I really am. And this is what's amazing. What did the Bible say? He goes and he gets a colt. Now, when you read this whole procession, Everybody's surrounding him. He's on a colt. Everybody bowing down, worshiping palms, you know, Palm Sunday, palm branches, worshiping, throwing their clothes. You might think that's a religious thing. It's not. It's a Roman culture thing. If you don't know, every single time a Caesar, a king, or a captain of an army would win a war or defeat their enemy, they would come home and they would get on a war horse I was going to show a bunch of pictures today, but this is not literature class time. But if you look up all the first century Roman uh, 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 officers, captains, or kings, or Caesars coming home, you'll see photos of them on a white war horse, surrounded by flowers, on top of a, uh, a procession of all their servants around them. And you will see in literature, they will yell, thank you for saving us. Thank you for defeating our enemy. And when they would come home, the whole city would come out and worship them and thank them as their king came home from battle. Jesus is taking over a Roman procession. Oh, that's what you do to worship your kings? Oh, that's how you guys welcome your king back home? Watch how I come through my procession. But what's fascinating is Jesus does not come on a war horse. He is not surrounded by peasants. He's not surrounded by flowers. He's not behind a Roman brigade. He's on a donkey. Jesus is not just making a statement, I'm a king. He's making a statement, what kind of king he is. That is why it says in verse five, tell the people your king is coming to you, the humble king is coming. Not just a king, a humble king. He's not riding in on a war horse with all of his battalion, all of his servants and slaves, all the flowers. He's not on a, a, some special carrier. He's on a donkey because he is the humble king. And may I say something to you today? If humility looks good on Jesus, it looks good on you. If humility looks good on Jesus, it will look good on you. You know what's fascinating? Is humility is not false confidence. Notice how he's letting everybody say who he is while remaining humble. Humility is not, no, that wasn't me. That was the Lord. Like Mike is an amazing drummer. He's not going to get out of service today. If you're like, Mike, you're so good. That was the Lord. No, Mike has tried very hard his entire life to be good at the drums. Mike played the drums today with the gift that God gave him in humility. Do not confuse humility with false humility, but also don't confuse humility with pride. 
If Jesus knows who he is, yet rides on a donkey, who are we to know who we are but ride in on a war horse? Tell everyone, this is who I am. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done? Jesus rides in on a donkey, the king of the universe. Does not ride in on a war horse on some special procession. He rides in on a donkey. And this is what's, well, you need the, the, the question, you need the process today. Is he your king? Not is he your friend. Not is he your comforter. Not is he your special genie that you rub when you need something from him. Not is he the one that like, makes you feel better about yourself. Not is he the one that gets you, gets you out of hell. If it's real, I don't want to go. So wait, wait, time out. Is he your king? Because his friendship didn't get him murdered. His kingship did. His teaching did not get him murdered. His kingship did. Jesus is finally making a statement. I'm not just a good teacher. I'm the king of the earth. I'm not just a prophet. I'm the king of the earth. I'm not just a good man. I'm the king of the earth. I'm not just a better human. I'm the king of the earth. And I will ride in on my procession just like all your other kings did. I will do the same. But I'm the final king that will do this. But this is what's so challenging. And this is where Jesus is so confrontational. His statement well, as he rides in is this, either king me or kill me. And I would submit to you the same way that Jesus rode into the heart of Jerusalem, he's riding into the heart of every human on this earth. And you have to make a decision, either I will kill him or I will king him. He will not accept anything in the middle. He cannot be your friend without being your king. But if he is your king, he will be your friend. He can't be your comforter and not be your king. But if he is your king, he will be your comforter. Jesus is so confrontational. I will ride in and either you will love me as king or you'll kill me as a liar. But I will accept nothing in the middle. That is why Jesus says to all the churches in Luke, uh, uh, sorry, Revelation 2, I don't want you, I want you hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out. How challenging is that? I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. Isn't it weird, even with food, food is pretty good, really hot or really cold. Lukewarm is the worst food. Even pizza. And pizza's never bad. But we, even with food, we want it hot or totally cold. We don't like it tempted and kind of warm and kind of cold, kind of hot. Jesus says, I'd rather be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Friend, you have two choices today. Either you kill him because you don't want that king or you king him. These are our choices. And probably half the room is offended by that. Like, well, I just want Jesus to be my friend. I want to pray to him every once in a while. I like him more than the other options. I'm trying to be a good person. Friend, is he your king? Number two, second question, I want you to pick up details. Not only these are riding on a donkey, and he is our king. Number two, who is at the center of your parade? Who's at the center of your parade? The Bible says in great detail, once again, details matter. The Bible says in great detail, the whole city comes out and Jesus is at the center of the procession. Who is at the center of your procession, your, procession, your parade of your life? Now, before all the Christians yell, Jesus, let's process for a moment. How do I know who's at the center? Who do you think about all the time? Who do you make decisions in direct correlation to all the time? Who are you scared to offend? Who do you think about before every decision you make? Who do you think about first? Jesus. No, it's probably your job. It's probably your money. It could be relationships. It could be your status, your titles, your degrees, your pedigree, your C-suite job, the school that you went to, the money that you have, the family that you come from, the, who your dad is, who your sisters are, what your dad has accomplished, what your family firm has accomplished, what job you have at your job, like what, what, what role you have, how much money you have, your 401k. What is at the center of your procession? That everything, hear me, that everything else in your life circles around and yells, save us. Because that's what Hosanna means. Save us, please. What are you putting in the middle of your life that everything else is circling going, please save us. Economy, please save us. America, please save us. My job, please save us. My pedigree, please save us. Who is at the center of your procession? 
Because Jesus will either say, king me or kill me. He will either leave the procession or he'll lead it. Jesus is not going to gather with everybody else and worship your job. He'll leave the procession. Jesus is not going to gather and worship your money or your job or your friends or your title. Fill in the blank. Jesus is either at the center or he leaves the procession. Because we have to choose, is he my king? Who's at the center of your procession? This is what's very interesting. Um, from like a counseling standpoint, all you parents in the room, can I help you for a moment? If you want your children to go to counseling for the rest of their life, make them at the center of every room. That didn't get too many amens. I thought it'd be more, but that wasn't. Amen. The reason why some of you at 24 don't know who you are is because you've always been at the center of every room of your whole life. Because you're not made to be the center of the world. You're not made to be the center of every conversation. Do you notice that every conversation works its way back to you? Every decision works its way back to you? Every vacation works its way back to you? It's called narcissistic thinking. You become the center. Everything arrows back to you. Every convo comes back to you. Every decision comes back to you. Every friend group, every table, every luncheon, every outing. Why are you always at the center of your own parade? You will ruin your life if you are constantly at the center of your own parade. You know what's fascinating? Is when Jesus was born in um, the manger with the quiet animals and the tranquility and the barn. None of that's real. But we'll just paint this American picture of what happened. You know what's interesting? When Jesus was born, he was at the center. And the Bible says, and all the wise men circled around him to worship. He was born in the center. Where does Jesus die? Between two thieves. He dies in the center. From the day he comes, he was the center. From the moment he leaves, he was in the center. And in between him on his way, he was in the center. From middle, from beginning, middle, and end. Every aspect of the big moments of Jesus' life. Who's at the center? Not you. Not your money. Not your job. Not your business, not our nation, not any other nation, not our thing that we voted for. Jesus is always from beginning, middle, and end. He's always at the center. Why? Because he's the only human worthy of it, and he's the only person that can sustain it. Who's at the center of your procession? What, what everything else in your life is bowing down to that thing. Jesus must become and Holy Week and Palm Sunday is reminding us, Jesus must be at the center of my procession. Otherwise, my procession will end in destruction. It's fascinating. The gospel is always being preached before it happened. Write this down. This is worthy of your consideration. Sin is when servants take the place of a king. Salvation is when the king takes the place of the servant. Sin is when servants take the place of the king. Salvation is when the king takes the place of the servant. Do you know how sin entered the world? We were the middle of the procession. Do you know how the king fixes it? He becomes the servant in the middle of the procession. This is the gospel before he even dies for us. He goes, where the king was supposed to be up here, that's what you guys did. You took my place, that's how this fell. I'll take your place, that's how I'll fix it. This is the gospel, this is the cross. Even before he goes to it, he goes, hey, you're supposed to be here, the lowly place, the humble place, the servant place. I'm the king of the earth, but I'm humble enough to lower myself and I'll put myself in the place of the servant. Or St. Louis says, Jesus came that the sons of God might become the sons of man, that the sons of men might become the sons of God. It's the great reversal. But sin entered because we put our place in his place. And he fixes it by him putting his place in our place. Who's at the center of your procession? Third question. Okay, we're getting somewhere. I'm becoming more and more like my dad, and it's scaring me. 
My third question for you, and let me explain it. Is he worthy of your clothes? Is he worthy of your clothes? You know what's an interesting detail? The Bible does not just say they throw their palm branches down. The Bible says they take off their garments and lay them down. What an interesting detail. Why does that matter? Furthermore, I have a kind of bone to pick with God. I'm already yelling, Hosanna, why do you want my clothes? I'm already yelling, Hosanna. I'm already worshiping. Aren't my words enough? Isn't worship just words? Isn't singing just words? God, I'm already giving you my words. What else do you want? And they go, they take off their garments and they lay them at the feet of Jesus and he rides over them on his donkey. Why? If you study Jewish literature and Roman Greco world, clothing mattered. What color your robe is mattered. That's why the Bible gives detail. When people would wear purple clothing, they were making a statement, I'm rich. It'd be like you pulling up the church in a Rolls Royce. I have money, I can afford this car. It'd be like you having people over to your home, that's a 10,000 square foot home, I have money. Their things weren't possessions, it was clothing. So if I showed up in a purple garment, I'm making a statement. Every garment color mattered. The color mattered and the content mattered. Not only did the color matter, it's what kind of material was it? What kind of linen was it? Who made it for you? Your clothing was your social status on how you felt about yourself. And what do they do when their king gets in the center? They take off their social recognition. They take off their pedigrees. They take off their CEO title. They take off Duke University grad. They take off business entrepreneur money in my bank account. They take off, I have, they take everything they are and they lay it down before Jesus. And he rides over it. He rides over it like it's dirt. He's on a donkey, not a war horse, on a servant's donkey. And says, I will ride over everything you think is important. Because I'm the king, not you. Take off your clothes. Take off your importance. Take off your pedigree. Lay them at my feet and I will ride over them because I'm more important than what you wear. Is he worth your clothes? And this is amazing. What would happen when everybody would throw their clothes down we would all be on the same level. I can no longer address you by what you're wearing. What color, what content, what pattern, what linen, where'd you get it from? We've all laid down everything we believe is true. And now we are all on the same page yelling, holy, 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 Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. I could be a C-suite, I could be, I could be in, in community college, I could have money, I could be overdrafting, I could have many kids, I could be praying for kids. Fill in the spectrum of where you're at. We all lay down our clothing, we all lay down our pedigree, we all lay down our titles, and now on the same playing field, we all lift our hands, we all lift our voices, and we put Jesus in the center. You might be the center at your work, but you're not the center in here. You might be the center of your family. You're not the center in here. Every single Sunday, we leave the center. And we put the only one worthy of the center where he should be. And we lay our clothes down. And we all get on the same playing field. And we sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, it's wild. There's many times, many times in the Bible. I don't have time to do this. But many times in the Bible, humans are referenced as trees. Many times. Human beings are references to trees of the earth. And what do, what do trees have? Branches. Worship is not just with our words. It's when we lift our branches. And we sing holy, holy, holy. 
Hosanna, 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 for I will honor son of David with my mouth and I will wave my palm branches because I'm a tree like the earth and I will wave my palm branches and I will declare the king has finally come and I will sing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. I will lay my clothes down. I will lay my, my worth down and he will walk over it like it's nothing because it is. Because it is. One of the last scenes we see in Revelation is all the kings of the earth taking off their crowns and throwing at the feet of Jesus because, oh, I might be important there, but I'm no king here. I will lay my crowns. Churches get in trouble when we walk into these rooms and keep our crowns on. Leadership teams get in trouble when we keep our crowns on. Churches get in trouble when we keep our clothes on. Well, (laughs) and I meant that in the pun and it was funny. We all walk in, what are you wearing? Where'd you get that from? Where do you work? How many kids do you have? How much money do you have? A vacation home, boat? Where do you guys vacation? Where do you guys go? Where'd you do your honeymoon? Where do you work for? Where'd you go to college? And we keep our clothes on, sizing everyone up. Is he worthy of your clothes? We all want to scream yes. But do you know what in verse 8? Oh, so good. Verse 8, most of the crowd did this. Not all. Most of them did. Do you know why? Because there were some standing there. I ain't ain't taking my clothes off. I paid for this. I worked hard for this linen. Linen. If I take this off, nobody will know who I am. This is my identity. If I take this off, I forget who I am. I'm not throwing, I'll do the palm branches because that was free. These are free. I just go to a tree and take it off and lay it down. You know what's not free? Your clothes. Is he worthy? of your clothes, for the king of the earth to ride in on a donkey, not on a chariot, not holy grandeur, not a donkey. And he rides over them all and he doesn't apologize for it. Because he knows it's time for you to start calling me the son of David because the king has come. So this is why many of you might wanna grab this on your way out It's not some Catholic thing. It's not some old weird church thing that your grandma has this in her fridge, tied up like a cross, you know, next to her bed. (laughs) All of you had that, grandma. (laughs) We all had the same grandma. Could it be the reason why we take these palm trees home is so that during Holy Week, as we fix our eyes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we put this at our desk, in our car, in our home, and every time we see it, we're reminded the king has come. And I will lay down my branches because the king is coming home. What's interesting as well, I have so much to say. The procession's out of order. Processions are done after the king comes home from war. Not before. The procession doesn't even make sense. It's out of order. The procession would make more sense as if after he rose from the dead, they welcomed the king home. They do it before he does it. Because for many times, that's what worship is. Many times worship is prophetic, not practical. Many times worship is saying, it ain't done yet, but I will worship as if it was. He hasn't done it yet. I don't see it yet. I haven't got it yet, but I will lift my branches. I will lift my voice. I will lay my clothes down as if it's already done. Because it is. Fourth. My fourth question, which tyranny 
are you focused on? Or tyranny, however you say it, leave me alone. <laughs> Jesus kept telling his disciples, I'm here to make a new kingdom. And they're like, let's go, Rome sucks. <laughs> we're tired of being under the boot of the Roman Empire. Let's get our kingdom going. Because they were convinced it was physical. Jesus is going to overthrow Caesar, the Roman Empire, we're getting ourselves a new kingdom. He dies, resurrects, goes back to heaven, and they're still in the same kingdom. They start getting frustrated. I thought you said you'd bring a new kingdom. I thought you said you'd destroy the, the Rome of the earth. Let me help you out. Jesus was not focused on the earthly Rome. He was focused on the eternal Rome. Rome, by what I mean, enemy. In other words, Jesus, the cross of Jesus is not saving us from earthly tyranny. He's saving us from eternal tyranny. And isn't it true from those disciples to us, we still get mad at Jesus when he doesn't do it our way. You said new kingdom, where is it? You said you would save us. You know what Hosanna means? Save us, comma, now. Save us right now. He goes, I'm gonna save you right now, but not how you think. I'm going to destroy Rome while you still live in it. I'm going to, I'm going to destroy the ultimate Caesar while you still are under the, this current one. In other words, we want current sin destroyed and God zooms out and he destroys eternal sin. Which tyranny are you focusing on? What Jesus didn't do, I'm still in this situation. Zoom out, friend. Rome has been defeated. Caesar has lost, but maybe not the one that you think. Do you know what we do during this week as we celebrate, as we sing, as we do our grandma's waving of the, the branches? We're reminded this Rome might still be real, but the Rome has lost. Oh, I know this situation is still happening and God hasn't got me out of this one, but he got me out of the biggest one I could not get myself out of. Oh, this moment is still real. This pain, this Roman empire that we all find ourselves in is real. But if I have fixed my attention on a different tyranny, the death is lost. Hell has lost. Sin has lost. Caesar has lost. The ruler of this world has lost. But which one are you focusing on? The current one? The marriage, the finances, the business? The, which one are you focusing on? Oh, friend, lift your attention. Lift your focus. To what this actually means. I'm going to read this verse in Romans, sorry, uh, Revelation 7, how this all ends. This is heaven. This is the it. We win. Jesus comes back on his horse, which is interesting. Man, this is so good. He comes back on a horse, though, not a donkey. He does not return back on a donkey. Oh, he comes back on his war horse. Because now he's making the ultimate statement. Oh, it's time for me to be the cosmic king that I always was. And he comes back on his horse with a sword and he just finished war. That's what the Bible says. He has blood on his robe because he just finished war. He's not just the Matthew 5 sweet little Jesus. Read the end. We don't serve a passive king. He comes back on his horse. We go to heaven, new earth. We see all the angels around the throne, 24 angels singing holy, 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 holy for all eternity. And then it says this. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing in front of the throne, they were clothed, clothing in white robes. And they held palm branches in their hands. 
And they were all shouting with a great roar, salvation has come for the one who sits on the throne. He is the lamb. It still ends that way. We are still ending with Jesus on the throne, not you. Him on the throne. And we have our palm branches singing. Oh, salvation has come for the one who sits on the throne. For he is the lamb of the earth. It still ends with palm branches and clothing. Oh, friend, this is not some cute little Palm Sunday. Take your photo, get your likes, go get mimosas. What a fun Palm Sunday. Oh, what time out. Let us be theologically reminded why we celebrate Palm Sunday. It's because the eternal humble king has started riding in through the procession. And I will lift my hands. I will lift my branches. I will lift my voice. Oh, son of David, Hosanna now. Thank you for saving us. Welcome home, our king. Oh, this is why we celebrate Palm Sunday. We put the king in his rightful place. We welcome him home into the procession of our life. And we lift our voice, we lift our hands, and we say, oh, Hosanna, welcome home, my king. Welcome home, my king. And we put him where he belongs. Oh, it's more than your grandma's cute thing on her fridge. It's more than photos. Oh, it's Holy Week. It's when we celebrate the King has come. We consider Good Friday, which we have Good Friday, you should come. We consider Resurrection Sunday. Oh, the final King is here.